chapter one of on sensation and the sensible in parva naturalia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by geoffrey edwards parva naturalia by aristotle translated by william alexander hammond on sensation and the sensible chapter one now that we have treated of the soul in its essential nature and of the faculties that belong to it part by part our next duty is to investigate the subject of living creatures and everything that has life to determine what functions are specific and what functions are general let us then take what has already been said touching the soul for our basis and as we proceed to the remaining inquiries let what is first by nature be first in our discussion the most important vital phenomena whether one regards the specific or general attributes of animals are those which are the joint concern of soul and body such as sensation memory anger desire and impulse in general and one may add pleasure and pain these are experienced by almost all animals in addition to these however there are other attributes which are common to all animals that share in life and others still that belong only to certain animals the most important of the former class may be enumerated in four pairs viz sleeping and waking youth and old age inspiration and expiration life and death we must study the nature of each of these phenomena and the causes of its occurrence the investigation too of the ultimate principles of health and disease is the province of the naturalist for neither health nor disease can apply to creatures when deprived of life and so it happens as i think that most natural philosophers and those physicians who have a more philosophical understanding of their science conclude in the one case with the investigation of medicine and in the other begin their practice with deductions from the laws of nature and their application to medicine the above-mentioned phenomena are evidently the common property of soul and body for they are all conjoined with sensation or are mediated by it some of them are modifications of sensation or persistent conditions of it others are protective or preservative of sensation while others still are destructive and negative that sensation is mediated by the body to the soul is plain both with and without the use of rational proof however regarding the essential nature of sense perception and the reason why animals are endowed with it we have already stated our views in the treatise on the soul every animal in so far as it is a living creature must have sensation for it is in terms of this that we distinguish between animal and non-animal touch and taste must belong to all animals individually touch for reasons given in the treatise on the soul and taste on account of food for it is by taste that animals discriminate between agreeable and disagreeable in foods and so reject the one and take the other in a word flavour is an affection that belongs to the nutritive soul sensations that are excited by external objects such as smell hearing and vision are found in animals capable of locomotion and are given to all of them for the sake of their preservation in order that they may scent their food and pursue it and flee from what is harmful and destructive in the case of animals endowed with intelligence they are given for the sake of higher well-being for these sense perceptions convey to us various distinctions out of which the knowledge of intellectual and moral concepts is built up amongst the senses vision is the most important both in itself and for the necessities of life on the other hand for the uses of reason and accidentally hearing is the most important 
the power of vision informs us of many and various distinctions because all bodies are suffused with colour so that by means of this sense more than by any other we perceive the common properties of objects by common properties i mean form magnitude motion number hearing on the other hand informs us merely of distinctions in sound and in some instances of distinctions in articulate voice indirectly however hearing contributes the greatest share to our intellectual life for it is the spoken and heard word that is the source of knowledge and hearing is the source not in itself but accidentally language is composed of words and every word is a symbol this explains the fact that in cases where men are deprived of one or the other of these senses from birth the blind are more intelligent than the deaf and dumb chapter two we have already treated of the function of the several special senses writers nowadays attempt to correlate the senses with the physical elements as found in the bodily members in which the sense organs have their natural development with the fifth sense they are hard pressed not finding it easy to pair five senses with four elements all of them agree in regarding vision as connected with fire on account of a certain phenomenon whose nature they misunderstand viz when the eye is pressed and moved it seems to scintillate but this takes place in the dark or when the eyelids are shut in which case darkness is produced and there is also another difficulty here for if it is impossible for a perceiving and seeing subject to be unconscious of a seen object then the eye must necessarily see itself why then does this not take place when the eye is at rest the explanation of this phenomenon as well as the solution of the entire difficulty and of the apparent fact that vision is fire is to be found in the following considerations it is the nature of smooth surfaces to shine in the darkness although they produce no light now we observe that the dark central portion of the eye has a smooth surface this becomes apparent when the eye is moved because the single organ is thereby made double an effect which is produced by the rapidity of the motion in this way the seeing organ and the seen object appear to be different for the same reason also this effect fails to be produced when the motion is not rapid and does not take place in the dark for it is in a medium of darkness that a smooth surface naturally shines as we see in the case of the heads of certain fishes and in the juice of the cuttlefish the consequence is that when the eye is moved slowly the seeing organ and seen object do not appear to be at once unitary and dual when on the other hand the movement is rapid the eye sees itself as in the reflection of a mirror now if vision were fire as empedocles declares and as we read in the timaeus and if seeing resulted from the passage of light out of the eye as from a lamp the question arises why is it that we do not see in the dark also to say as the timaeus does that the light when it passes out from the eye is extinguished in the darkness is a totally empty assertion for what is meant by an extinction of light the warm and the dry it is true are nullified by the moist and the cold as one sees in the case of a coal fire or a flame but neither of these has anything to do with light if however they are attributes of light but are concealed from us owing to their subtle presence then light ought to be extinguished in the day during rain and darkness should increase in frosty weather flame and ignited bodies are so affected but nothing of the sort takes place in the case of light empedocles appears to hold the view that vision results from the eyes radiating light as we said before his own words at any rate are as follows Quote, as a man taking thought for his journey a lantern prepares whose flame flashes light through the blustering night as he passes and shudders he fastens defence from winds to scatter the breath of the blowing blasts while the light pierces through by its fineness 
and gleams over the threshold unfailing so of old fire elemental was fixed in membranes and suffused the round pupil held in thin tissues a check to the water while the fire pierces through by its fineness Close quote. sometimes he gives the above explanation of vision and at other times he explains it by means of emanations from visible objects democritus says that vision is due to water and in this he is right but he is wrong in thinking that it consists in reflection for reflection is produced because the eye is a smooth surface vision however does not take place in this smooth surface but in the seeing subject now the condition to which he refers is only a reflection of light he has however as i think no clear idea whatever concerning the general nature of images and reflection it is also strange that it never occurs to him to raise the question why it is that the eye alone sees while no other object in which images are reflected has vision his statement that vision partakes of the nature of water is true but vision is not due to the fact that the eye is water but to the fact that it is transparent which characteristic it has also in common with the air water however is easier to fix and is thicker than air and it is for this reason that the eye and its pupil are composed of water this can be proved also from actual facts when the eyes are destroyed water is seen to flow out of them and even in their quite embryonic stage the eyes are exceedingly limpid and brilliant further the white of the eye in sanguineous animals is fat and oily which serves the purpose of keeping the humid element from congealing consequently the eye can resist cold better than any other organ of the body no one ever experienced the sensation of cold in the interior of the eye the eyes of bloodless animals are covered with a hard skin which furnishes protection the theory is altogether irrational which makes vision consist as some hold in a sort of radiation and regards this radiation of something from the eye as extending to the stars or as extending to some point and there affecting a combination with the object it would be better to assume that this combination of the eye with its object were in the eye's original nature but even this is nonsense for what is one to understand by this combination of light with light or how is such a thing to take place for nothing combines in a haphazard way with anything else further how can the internal light combine with an external one for between them is the intervening membrane regarding the fact that there is no vision without light we have spoken elsewhere but whether the intervening medium between the visible object and the eye is light or air it is in any case the motion through this medium that produces sight and it is reasonable to regard the interior of the eye as composed of water for water is diaphanous and as nothing external is seen without light the same thing applies to the internal the internal also must therefore be diaphanous since this diaphanous is not air it must be water for the soul or the perceptive power of the soul is not found on the eye's surface but evidently within consequently the eye's interior must be diaphanous and sensitive to light and this we can see empirically for cases have happened in war where persons have received such a blow across the temples that the ocular conduits were severed and darkness seemed to ensue just as when a lamp is put out and this is due to the fact that the diaphanous i e the pupil as we call it was cut off as in the snuffing of a lamp if therefore this takes place in some such way as we describe it is evidently necessary to render an explanation of this kind and to correlate each sense organ with one of the elements viz the seeing power of the eye we must derive from water the sense for sound from the air and smell we must associate with fire for the organ of smell is potentially what smell itself is actually the sensible object stimulates the sensation into actuality 
and consequently the latter must have an antecedent potential existence smell is a smoke-like exhalation and this is derived from fire it is for this reason too that the organ of smell is especially assigned to the environment of the brain for the material substrate of cold is potentially warm and the same explanation holds good for the development of the eye it is formed from a part of the brain for the brain is the moistest and coolest member of the body the organ of touch is derived from the element earth and taste is a form of touch consequently the organs of these two senses taste and touch are found to conduct towards the heart the heart occupies a counterposition to the brain and is the warmest member of the body regarding the sense organs of the body let the above determination suffice end of chapter two recording in memory of mitchell edwards chapter three of on sensation and the sensible in parva naturalia by aristotle translated by william alexander hammond this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter three in the treatise on the soul i have given a general account of the objects of sense in their application to the several sense organs such as colour sound smell flavour and the tangible i have explained their function and their activity organ by organ but we must also determine what each of these things is apart from the organ e g we must ask what is colour what is sound what is smell what is flavour we must likewise inquire regarding the tactual and we must begin with colour everything has a twofold significance viz that of actuality and potentiality it has been explained in the treatise on the soul in what way actual colour and actual sound coincide with and differ from the actual sensations of seeing and hearing we must now explain what each of these sensible objects must be in order to produce sensation and its activity we have already said in the above-named treatise regarding light that it is the colour of a diaphanous medium accidentally produced for when anything fire-like is found in the diaphanous its presence constitutes light and its absence signifies darkness what we understand by diaphanous is not a property peculiar to air or water or to any other so-called body but it is a certain natural constitution and power common to both these bodies and found also in certain others in greater or less degree but which has no independent and separate existence and furthermore as there must be a limiting surface in bodies so here also light is found in an indeterminate diaphanous it is also evident that the diaphanous in bodies must have a surface and that this surface is colour is plain from observed facts for colour is found either in the boundary or it is itself the boundary it is for this reason that the pythagoreans characterised the visible superficies as colour colour indeed is given in the boundary properties of body although it does not itself constitute that boundary on the contrary one must suppose that the same colour quality which is observed on the exterior applies also to the interior both air and water are seen to be coloured for even their shimmer is colour in these cases however air and the sea because of their unfixed character do not have the same colour when viewed near at hand and from a distance in solid bodies on the other hand the appearance of the colour is fixed unless the surrounding medium makes it shift it is evident therefore that the principle which is sensitive to colour is in both the former and the latter instances the same the diaphanous then in so far as it is found in bodies and it is found more or less in them all causes them to be saturated with colour 
inasmuch as colour is found in the boundary of bodies it would also be found in the boundary of the diaphanous substance consequently colour might be defined as the boundary of the diaphanous in a definite body colour attaches also to diaphanous bodies themselves such as water and other similar elements and it is also found in all such bodies as have a surface colour which is peculiar to the body itself there is then on the one hand the possibility that the positive principle which in the air produces light should also be contained in the diaphanous on the other hand it is possible that this should not be the case but that the condition then should be one of privation as in the case of air we have the two phenomena light and darkness so in bodies we have the two qualities white and black regarding the other colours we must now decide after analysis in how many ways they can be produced for black and white may be so juxtaposed that each of the two on account of its minuteness when taken alone will be invisible while the combination of the two will be visible the latter cannot be seen either as white or black but inasmuch as it must have some colour and it can be neither of these two it must be a mixed colour and different in kind from the others it is then a possible supposition that there are several colours besides white and black but their manifoldness is due to proportion this proportion can be expressed by the relation of three colon two or of three colon four or colours can be related to each other in terms of other numbers and some may not be expressible at all in terms of any proportion but in terms of some incommensurable plus and minus the same thing applies also to harmony of tones those colours which are expressed by harmonious numbers as is also true of tone harmonies appear to be the most pleasing such as sea purple crimson and a few others like them they are few for the same reason that harmonious tones are few the other colours are not numerically expressible or is it true that all colours are numerically expressible although some colours depend upon a regular order while others depend upon an irregular order and the latter have this character when they are not pure this is one explanation of the genesis of colours another explanation is that they shine through one another as we see sometimes in the works of artists when they superadd a colour on a background of a different colour e g when they wish to produce the effect of an object seen in the water or in the air so it is also with the sun which in its own nature appears white but red when seen through mist and smoke and many other colours will be produced in the same way as above described that is to say a certain proportion might be supposed to exist between the colours on the superficies and the colours in the depths and others again may not be expressible in terms of quotes, proportion at all it is therefore absurd to say with the ancients that colours are efflexes and for this reason are visible for in their opinion it is absolutely necessary that sensation be effected through contact and it is consequently better to say at once that the medium of sensation is set in motion by the sensible object and that in this way sensation is produced by contact and not by effluxes in the case of juxtaposed colours just as one must suppose an invisible magnitude so must one suppose an imperceptible moment of time in order to explain the fact that the movements issue imperceptibly and because they are simultaneously visible the impression is a single one there is however no such necessity here but the colour on the superficies when unmoved and when set in motion by its substrate produces unlike motions in the medium consequently it appears different and neither white nor black so that if an invisible magnitude is not possible but every magnitude must be visible from a certain distance so there must be here also a certain mixture of colours in this way one may suppose that in objects viewed from a distance a certain common colour is seen for that there is no invisible magnitude is a matter that must be investigated later
if a mixture of bodies takes place then it is not merely in the way that some think viz by the juxtaposition of minimal parts which are imperceptible to our senses but also in the form of a general mixture of the entire substance together as explained in outline in our treatise on mixture by the former method of composition only those substances can be mixed which are capable of analysis into minimal parts e g men horses or seeds in the case of quotes, men a man is the minimal part in the case of quotes, horses a horse consequently in both instances the mass is formed by juxtaposition of these minimal parts we do not however speak of a man being mixed with a horse whatever cannot be analyzed into minimal homogeneous parts is incapable of mixture in this sense but only in the sense of total mixture which is what naturally takes place in most cases in our treatise on mixture we have already explained how this can take place where bodies are mixed their colours must evidently be mixed also and this is the principal cause of the multiplicity of colours which is not explained by their being superposed or by their juxtaposition it is not true that what is mixed has one colour when viewed near by and another when viewed at a distance for it has one colour when viewed from all points and colours will be manifold because of the possibility of manifold proportions being employed in mixtures some of which will be based on numerical proportion others on that of disproportionate mass further the same thing may be said of mixed colours as was said of juxtaposed and superposed colours the explanation of the fact that we have fixed and definite varieties of colours flavours and sounds will be given later chapter four we have now explained the meaning of colour and the cause of its multiplicity we had already discussed the subject of sound and articulate speech in the treatise on the soul smell and flavour now remain to be discussed both these terms signify almost identical natural affections only each of them is found in a different organ the quality of flavours is more distinct to us than that of smells the reason is that our sense of smell is inferior to the same sense in other animals and is inferior to all our other senses while we of all animals have the most accurate sense of touch and taste is a sort of touch water in its own nature has no flavour and yet it is necessary that water should contain within itself the varieties of flavours which owing to their infinitesimal character are indiscernible as empedocles says or else there must be in water some such matter as is the universal germ origin of flavours and in this way all flavours are generated out of water different flavours from different parts or again supposing that water contains no qualitative differences we must then find some other efficient cause of flavour such as heat or the influence of the sun the error of the empedoclean theory is very easy to detect for we actually observe flavours undergoing change under the influence of heat e g when we expose fruits to the sun by removing their pericarps or by heating them before a fire they do not acquire this new flavour by drawing it out of the water but by undergoing a change in the removal of the pericarp itself when fruits are dried and stored they become in time instead of sweet pungent or bitter or change their flavour variously and when cooked they acquire so to speak all sorts of flavours so too the theory that water is a panspermic matter is impossible for we observe that out of one and the same thing as out of the same foodstuff different flavours are generated there remains the theory that water by undergoing some external influence changes it is plain that the phenomenon which we call flavour is not due to the potency of heat for water is the thinnest of all liquids subtler than oil itself oil however is more expansile than water because of its viscous character water being non-cohesive for this reason it is harder to hold water in one's hand than it is to hold oil 
now since water is the only liquid which when heated exhibits no denser consistency than before we must evidently look elsewhere for the cause of flavour for all flavours are more dense when heated heat is a contributing cause not the sole one apparently the flavours that are found in fruits have a prior existence in the earth in the same spirit many of the ancient physiologers say that water is like the soil through which it passes and this is particularly evident in the case of salt waters for salts are a form of soil also water that has been filtered through bitter ashes acquires a bitter taste further we often find springs that are bitter and others that are pungent while others still have different flavours the greatest variety of flavours is found as one might suppose amongst plants it is the nature of moisture as of other things to be affected by its opposite and its opposite is the dry consequently it is affected by fire which is by nature dry now heat is the peculiar property of fire and the dry is the peculiar property of the earth as was said in the treatise on the elements neither fire nor earth nor any other element as such acts or is acted upon it is only in so far as each thing contains in itself the principle of opposition that it either acts or is acted upon as therefore those who dissolve a colour or a flavour in water cause the water to absorb it so nature acts upon the dry and earthy elements and by filtering water through these elements and stimulating them into activity by heat it causes the moist element to acquire a certain quality this condition which is wrought in moisture by means of the above-mentioned dry element is flavour and it consists in the conversion of a potential taste into an actual one for the sense organ which is already in a condition of potentiality passes over into a condition of actuality the process of sensation does not resemble learning so much as it resembles contemplation that flavours do not attach to everything dry but only to the dry that is nutritive either as a positive or negative condition one may conclude from the fact that the dry is not found apart from the moist nor the moist apart from the dry neither one when taken alone is foodstuff for living creatures but only when combined in animal food it is the tactual elements which affect growth and decay and it is by virtue of the warmth or cold in the assimilated food that these phenomena are produced for these are the properties that cause growth and decay the administered food nourishes in so far as it is gustable for everything is nourished by means of the sweet whether pure or mixed this subject must be more definitely treated in the work on generation for the present we only touch upon it so far as necessary heat disposes to growth and brings food into a prepared condition it absorbs what is light and rejects the salt and bitter because of their heaviness what external heat effects in external bodies is also produced by internal heat in animals and plants nourishment then is caused by the sweet the other flavours are mingled in food in the same way as the bitter and pungent i e to serve as a relish this is for the purpose of counterbalance and because the sweet is overnutritive and swims on the stomach as colours are a combination of white and black so flavours are derived from sweet and bitter they depend severally on a proportion of more or less on a proportion of mixture and motion either numerically expressible or indeterminate those mixtures however which produce pleasure are numerically expressible the oily flavour is to be classed with the sweet the salt and bitter are closely allied while the sour pungent astringent and acid are intermediary and so the varieties of flavours and colours are pretty nearly the same in number for there are six of each if one regards as is reasonable the grey as a sort of black we have then to include yellow in white just as we referred the oily flavour to the sweet while crimson sea purple green and blue are intermediary between white and black and all other shades are combinations of these 
as black is privation of the white in a diaphanous medium so the salt and bitter are privation of the sweet in a nutritive moist substance consequently the ashes of anything that has been burnt are bitter for the potable element has been consumed democritus and most of the physiologers who treat the subject of sensation make the most remarkable blunder for they resolve all sensible objects into the tangible if indeed this is correct each of the senses becomes evidently a sense of touch it is not difficult to see that this is impossible further they treat the common functions of all the senses as special functions for the perception of magnitude figure roughness smoothness and sharpness and bluntness in solid bodies is the common function of all the senses and if not of all then at least the common function of sight and touch it is in these perceptions therefore that the senses are subject to error but they are not subject to error in their special sensations e g sight is not fallible regarding colour nor hearing regarding sound again these physiologers refer the special functions to the general as democritus does with white and black the latter of which he identifies with the rough and the former with the smooth and he reduces flavour to atomic forms and yet it is either not the function of any sense to discern common properties or else this power belongs to the eye more than to any other organ if however this power falls rather to the lot of taste it is at any rate the function of the most delicate sense to discriminate the slightest distinctions each after its kind so that taste would have to discriminate common properties better than any other sense and be the most discerning judge of atomic figures further all sensible objects contain the principle of opposition e g in colour black is the opposite of white and in flavour bitter is the opposite of sweet but one figure does not appear to be the opposite of another figure for to what sort of polygon would a circle be opposed further the atomic figures being infinite in number it necessarily follows that flavours are also infinite in number for what is the explanation of the fact that one flavour produces a sensation and another flavour does not produce it we have now treated the subject of the gustable and flavour the other aspects of flavour receive their proper consideration in the treatise on the physiology of plants end of chapter four Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards. Five of On Sensation and the Sensible in Parva Naturalia by Aristotle, translated by William Alexander Hammond. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by geoffrey edwards chapter five in like manner one must also treat of smell for the same effect which is produced by the dry or the moist is produced in another connection by savoury moisture in air and water equally now we observe that the diaphanous is a common principle in these two elements the element however is not odoriferous by virtue of its being diaphanous but by virtue of its capacity to exude and throw off dry savour for smell is exercised not only in the air but also in water this is evidently so in the case of fishes and mollusks for these are known to be endowed with smell although there is no air in the water for the air comes to the surface when found in water and they have no respiration if one assumes that both air and water are moist elements smell would be the dry sapidity in the moist and such would be the nature of an odoriferous body that this condition in an object is derived from a sapid element is a plain conclusion from things that do and do not emit smell for the simple elements such as fire air earth and water are non-odorous because the moist and dry in them are non sapid excepting when a combination is produced this is why even the sea has a smell it contains a sapid dry element 
salts are more odorous than nitre as is proven by the oil derived from them nitre in turn is more odorous than earth further a stone is inodorous for it is without sapidity woods on the other hand are odorous for they are sapid and amongst woods those that are watery are less odorous further amongst metals gold is inodorous for it is not sapid bronze however and iron are odorous when the moist element is burned out of metals the slag becomes still less odorous silver and tin are more odorous than some and less odorous than other metals for they contain moisture some writers regard smell as a smoke-like exhalation which is common to earth and air and all the naturalists fall back on this explanation of smell and so heraclitus made the remark that if all things were smoke we should discern everything by our nostrils now the naturalists all explain smell on this theory some of them describing it as vapour others as an exhalation and others as a combination of both of these vapour is a kind of moisture whereas a smoke-like exhalation is as we have said common to air and earth water is derived from vapour and a sort of earth is developed from smoke-like exhalation but neither of these two seems to be the odorous for vapour is due to water while smoke-like exhalation cannot possibly be generated in water and yet creatures that live in the water have the sense of smell as was said above again exhalations here have the same meaning as emanations and if the emanation theory was wrong so is this wrong it is clear that the moisture which is found in the air for the air also has a moist character and in water is capable of deriving something from the sapid dry element and of being affected by it furthermore if the dry element when saturated as it were acts in moisture in the same way as it does in air smells must evidently correspond to tastes but precisely this fact is found in certain flavours and savours for there are pungent sweet harsh astringent oily smells and one might say that rancid odours correspond to bitter tastes as the former therefore are revolting to the taste so rancid tastes are revolting to the smell evidently then that quality which in water is flavour in air and water is smell this explains why cold and frost blunt flavours and obscure smells for cold and frost nullify heat which is the moving and active principle here there are two sorts of odorous objects for it is untrue that there are no varieties of odorous objects as some maintain such varieties do exist one must however explain in what sense this is true and in what sense not true one variety corresponds as clearly explained to flavour and contains the pleasurable and painful accidentally for owing to the fact that these smells concern our nutritive power they are agreeable to those who have desire and disagreeable to those who are sated and feel no desire neither is the smell agreeable to those to whom the food which has the smell is disagreeable consequently these smells contain as we said the pleasant and painful accidentally and this is the reason why they are common to all animals there is another variety of smells which are pleasant in themselves e g the fragrance of flowers for they incite us in no respect whether more or less to food nor do they in any way contribute to the stirring of any desire they have rather the opposite effect what stratus says mocking euripides is true when lentil soup you cook pray add no spices to it by mixing such spices in their potations men nowadays force pleasure as is their habit believing that the pleasure which is really derived from two sensations is derived from only one smell of this sort is peculiar to man but smell that is based on flavour is sensed by other animals as remarked above 
the varieties of the latter because the pleasant is incidental are classified in terms of flavours which does not apply to the former class because there the smell is pleasant or disagreeable in itself the reason why this class of smells is peculiar to man is because of the condition of his brain for man's brain is by nature cool and the blood in its surrounding veins is thin and pure though easily chilled which explains why the evaporation of food when cooled in this region causes catarrhal colds and so this variety of smell has been developed in man as beneficial to his health for no other function can be ascribed to this class of smells although this function is evidently exercised by them food whether solid or liquid although agreeable is often harmful but the smell exhaled from savoury food indicates one may say what is absolutely and always beneficial to man in whatsoever condition he is consequently smell is mediated by respiration not in all animals but in man the quadrupeds and such other sanguineous animals as have a larger share in the employment of air for smells being transmitted to the brain by virtue of the levity of the heat in them the regions about the brain are thereby the more healthy for the potency of smell is naturally warm nature employs respiration for two purposes its main purpose is to assist the functioning of the chest its secondary function is to transmit smell for in respiration the air produces as it were in passage motion in the nostrils smell of this sort is peculiar to human nature for man has in proportion to his size the largest and moistest brain of all animals for this reason man is the only animal one may say that senses the smell of flowers and similar smells and finds pleasure in them for the warmth and movement in these smells is proportional to the excess of moisture and coolness in the brain to the other animals that are endowed with lungs for respiration nature has given the perception of another kind of smell so as to avoid the creation of two sense organs it is enough for these respiring animals that they have the sensation of only one class of smells while man discriminates both classes that the non-respiring animals possess the sense of smell is evident for fishes and all the varieties of insects on account of the connection between food and smell distinguish smells with precision and at a distance as we observe in the case of bees and that variety of small ants sometimes called snips and purple sea-fish as well as in the case of many other similar animals which have a keen sense of smell for food the organ of sensation is not so clearly defined one might therefore raise the question as to the organ of the sense of smell although smell is mediated exclusively by respiration this is plainly so in all respiring animals none of the above-mentioned animals however respire and yet they perceive smells unless we are to assume an additional sense beyond the five and this is impossible for it is smell that senses the odorous and these animals detect odour though perhaps not in the same way as respiring animals in respiring animals the breath lifts up a superficial membrane a sort of cover as it were for which reason they do not smell without respiration whereas in the non-respiring animals this is lacking just as over the eyes some animals have eyelids and without lifting these do not see while others are hard-eyed and have no lids and so do not need to lift any covering but see at once from the moment they are able to see and so too no other animal feels discomfort from a smell which is intrinsically malodorous unless it chances to be harmful but by these harmful smells animals are sometimes destroyed just as men often get a headache from coal gas and frequently lose their lives in the same way other animals are destroyed by sulphur and asphalt fumes and because they are so affected by such fumes they avoid them but for malodor as such they take no thought although many vegetables have bad smells excepting in so far as taste or food is influenced by it inasmuch as the number of the senses is uneven and every uneven number has a middle term it seems that smell occupies a middle position between the senses that operate by direct contact viz touch and taste 
on the one hand and those which function indirectly through a medium viz sight and hearing on the other hand consequently the odorous object is something which affects foods for these fall under the category of the tangible and further it affects audition because smells are sensed in the media of air and water smell then is in a way common to these two things and is found in the tangible the audible and the diaphanous it is with good reason therefore that smell has been compared to the imbrewing and washing of a dry element found in the moist and liquid regarding the sense in which one may or may not apply the term quotes, species to odours let the foregoing discussion suffice there is a view held by certain pythagoreans which is ill-founded they hold that certain animals feed on smells now we observe in the first place that food is a composite thing for the creatures which are nourished are not simple and consequently there is an excrement of food sometimes within the animal itself and sometimes external as in the case of plants further water when taken alone and unmixed is not fitted to yield nourishment for what is assimilated into the body must be of a solid nature again it is much less reasonable that air can become solid matter in addition to this we observe that all animals have a receptacle for food from which after its entrance the body assimilates it the sense organ however is situated in the head and smell enters with a breath-like inhalation so that it penetrates to the respiratory region that smell as such does not contribute to nourishment is plain that it does however contribute to health is evident from the sensation itself and from what has been said so that what flavour is to the nutritive organ and to the parts nourished this smell is to health let these then be our conclusions regarding the several sense organs chapter six one might raise the question whether supposing all bodies to be infinitely divisible the sensible qualities of bodies are also infinitely divisible such qualities as colour flavour smell sound weight cold heat lightness roughness and softness or must we say that this is impossible for every one of these qualities produces sensation they all receive their name from their capacity to stimulate sensation therefore sensation must be infinitely divisible and every magnitude must be sensible for it is impossible to perceive a white object without its having dimensions were this not true it would be possible to have a body without colour or weight or any similar quality in which case it would be absolutely imperceptible for these qualities constitute the sensible the sensible then would have to be composed of the non-sensible but it must be composed of sensible qualities for it cannot be composed of mathematical elements and furthermore what organ could we use for the discrimination and cognition of such elements could we employ reason but they are not rational elements neither does reason think the external world excepting in conjunction with sensation at the same time if this view of the infinite divisibility of sensible qualities were true it would appear to furnish support for the advocates of atomic magnitudes for in this way the problem would be solved it is however impossible this subject has been discussed in our treatise on motion in the solution of these questions one will see why it is that the various forms of colour flavour sound and other sensible qualities are determinate for in things that have extremes the internal properties must also be determinate the opposite is an extreme now every sensible quality implies opposition e g in colours white and black in flavour sweet and bitter and in everything else the opposites form extremes the continuous is therefore divisible into infinite unequal parts but into determinate equal parts now whatever is not in its own nature continuous is divisible into determinate forms inasmuch as qualities must be interpreted as forms and inasmuch as continuity is always given in these 
we must suppose a difference between the potential and actual this is why the ten thousandth part of a visible grain of millet is unseen although the eye rests upon it and so too a quarter tone is undetected by hearing although the whole continuous melody is heard but the interval from mean to extreme is not appreciable to us and the same thing applies to the excessively small amongst other sensible objects they are discernible potentially but not actually and when regarded in isolation a foot line is contained in a two foot line potentially but actually only after division has been made when excessively small parts like these are separated off it is reasonable to suppose that they would be lost in their environment just as a tiny particle of flavour is lost in the sea nevertheless since this excessively small particle when regarded in itself and in isolation is imperceptible for the excessively small has only a potential existence in a body that is more discernible neither is any sensible object of this sort in isolation actually perceptible and yet it is a sensible object because it is so potentially and will be actually so when added on to something we have now explained that certain magnitudes and qualities are imperceptible and have stated the reason for this and have shown in what sense things are perceptible and in what sense they are not when however inherent qualities are so constituted in reference to themselves as to be actually perceptible and not merely so in conjunction with an entire body but also when regarded alone then colours flavours and sounds must be numerically limited one might raise the question whether sensible objects or the movements excited by sensible objects whatever be the way in which sensation is affected by their activity are first transmitted to a medium as appears to be the case with smell and sound for a person standing near by has an earlier perception of a smell and a sound reaches one some time after a blow is the same thing true of the visible and of light according to empedocles sunlight is first transmitted to a medium before it reaches the eye or the earth and this seems to be reasonable for whatever is moved is moved from one point to another so that a certain time must elapse in which motion from one point to another takes place but all time is divisible and consequently there is a moment when the ray is not yet visible but is still in transit in the medium also if everything at the same moment hears and has heard and in a word perceives and has perceived and there is no time process in sensations nevertheless they lack this process in the same way in which sound after the blow has been struck has not yet reached the ear the shifting of letters also shows this plainly because their movement takes place in a medium for people appear not to have heard what was said because the air has shifted is this true also of colour and light for it is not owing to a particular condition that one thing sees and another is seen like two equivalent terms for it would not then have been necessary for either to be in a given position for when things are equivalent nearness or remoteness from each other makes no difference it is reasonable that succession in time should be found in sound and smell for like air and water they are continuous and yet their movement is divisible and so it sometimes happens that the nearest and most remote persons perceive the same smell and at other times this is not the case some persons find a difficulty also in the following it is impossible some say for different persons to hear see or smell the same thing in the same way for it is impossible for several persons who are separate from each other to hear and smell alike in that event the unitary object of sensation would have to be separated from itself the primary stimulus as a bell frankincense or a fire is perceived by all as numerically one and the same but in its peculiar qualities it is perceived with numerical differences though in its essential nature as one and the same thing for which reason many persons see smell or hear the same thing at the same time one is not concerned here however with bodies but with qualities and motion otherwise we should not have this phenomenon which are impossible apart from body the question of light is different 
for light has a substantial nature and is not a motion in general the same determinations are not to be applied to transformation and motion spatial motions take place as one might suppose first into a medium sound is thought to be the motion of something subject to spatial change whereas that which undergoes transformation does so in a way different from spatial change it is possible that transformation takes place in mass and not first by halves as in the case of water which freezes at once entire nevertheless if what is being heated or frozen should be of considerable bulk one part is affected by the adjacent part and the first part undergoes changes through its own alteration and it is not necessary that the entire mass undergo alteration at the same time taste would also be subject to the same conditions as smell if we lived in a medium of water and perceived smells from a distance without contact when we have a medium for the sense organ it is reasonable to suppose we do not receive all our impressions at once excepting in the instance of light on grounds already mentioned and sight is also accepted on the same grounds for light is the cause of sight end of chapter six recording in memory of mitchell edwards of on sensation and the sensible in parva naturalia by aristotle translated by william alexander hammond this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter seven another similar problem touching sensation arises here viz whether or not it is possible to experience two sensations at one and the same moment of time supposing it to be true that the stronger stimulus always displaces the weaker for this reason persons do not see an object that falls upon the eye if they chance to be deep in thought or exercised by fear or listening to a loud sound let this serve as a fundamental truth and let us also observe that it is easier to perceive what is simple than what is mixed e g it is easier to taste unmixed wine than mixed and so with honey and colour and it is easier to distinguish the highest note when taken alone than when heard in accord with the octave because the two things obscure each other this occurs in cases where a unity is produced from several elements if then the stronger displaces the weaker stimulus it must happen in case they are simultaneous that even the stronger stimulus becomes weaker than it would be if it were perceived alone for the weaker when mixed with it detracts from its clearness supposing it to be true that everything taken simply is more accurately perceptible if the two are equal neither one will be perceived for they will counteract each other equally but it is impossible to have a simple sensation consequently we shall have either no sensation at all or a new one fused out of both elements and this appears to be what actually happens with mixed elements so long as they are mixed since a fusion of certain things is possible and of others not the latter are such as fall within the province of different senses for where extremes are opposite fusion is possible but it is not possible to form white and acute into a unity excepting in an accidental sense not however in the sense in which a union between acute and grave is possible it is then impossible to have a simultaneous sensation of these qualities for the stimuli being equal destroy each other since a unitary stimulus is not derivable from them if however they are unequal the stronger stimulus produces the sensation for the soul more readily perceives two stimuli simultaneously when only one sense is concerned in the single act of sensation as e g acute and grave for simultaneous sensation on the part of a single sense is more easily attained than is the action of two senses such as sight and hearing but it is not possible to perceive two things simultaneously with one sense unless they are fused 
for the fusion will form a unity and a single sense can perceive a single thing and the single sensation is a chronological unit so then one necessarily perceives fused stimuli simultaneously because they are perceived by a sense process which in actuality is single the single sense in actuality perceives a numerically single object the single sense in potentiality perceives a specifically single object if the sensation therefore is in actuality single it will interpret the sense object as a single thing the sensations must then be fused when they are not fused the sensations will be in actuality too however there must be a single actuality which corresponds to a single potentiality and a single moment of time for the stimulation and exercise of a single sense is once for all single and its potentiality is single it is consequently impossible to perceive two objects at one time with a single sense but if two objects that fall under a single sense cannot be perceived simultaneously this is plainly much less possible when they fall under two senses as e g white and sweet for the soul seems to denote what is numerically one not otherwise than in terms of simultaneity the specifically one in terms of the discriminating sense and the character of the thing by this i mean that white and black which are specifically different are supposedly discriminated by the same sense also sweet and bitter are discriminated by the same sense although a different sense from the former one on the other hand the method of perceiving opposites is different while coordinated pairs are perceived in the self-same manner e g just as taste perceives the sweet so sight perceives the white as the sense of sight perceives the black so the former sense perceives bitter further if the sense processes of opposites are opposite to each other and if it is impossible for opposites to coexist in the same indivisible thing then where opposites fall under a single sense as e g sweet and bitter they cannot be perceived simultaneously and similarly it can be proven that things which are not opposites cannot be simultaneously perceived for some colours partake of white and others of black and this applies equally to other sensations e g amongst flavours certain ones have the character of sweet and others of bitter neither can fused objects be simultaneously perceived for their ratios have the character of contrariety e g the octave and the fifth unless they are perceived as one in this way and not otherwise a single ratio of extremes is produced for in any other case there will be produced at once the ratio of the many to the few and of the uneven to the even and on the other hand the ratio of the few to the many and of the even to the uneven if coordinates which are specifically different are further removed from each other and differ more than things that are specifically the same e g sweet and white i mention as coordinates but specifically different and sweet differs from black more than white does it would be still less possible for these opposites to be perceived simultaneously than it would be for opposites specifically the same so that if the latter are not simultaneously perceptible neither would the former be in regard to the opinion of certain writers who treat the subject of harmony and say that sounds do not really reach us at the same moment but only appear to do so and we do not notice this the time being imperceptible the question is whether their opinion is right or not here also one might perhaps say that we only appear to hear and see at the same time because the intervening time is not perceived this is incorrect it is impossible for time to be imperceptible or for us to be unconscious of it but every moment is perceptible for when one perceives one's self or something else in continuous time it is impossible for one to be then unconscious that one is but if there is in continuous time a moment of such duration that it is altogether imperceptible it is evident that one would then be unconscious of one's own existence or would not know 
whether or not one sees and perceives further even if one has perception time would not exist and there would be no object nor any moment in which sensation should take place unless it were in the sense that one sees in a part of time or a part of the object if there is a measure of time or object which owing to its smallness is totally imperceptible for if one sees the entire earth one also perceives time itself in its continuity and not in any of its isolated moments let c b represent a time division in which one has no perception one sees then in a particular part of the whole or sees a particular part just as one sees the entire earth viz by seeing a definite part of it and how far one walks in a year viz by seeing how far one walks in a definite part of a year but in the division b c there is no perception now by virtue of perceiving the whole a b in some definite part of it one is said to perceive even the entire earth and the same reasoning holds good of a c for one always perceives in a part and a part and it is impossible to perceive the entirety and so everything is perceptible but one does not see what its extent is for one sees the magnitude of the sun and of the four cubit measure from a distance they are not seen however in their real size but sometimes they seem indivisible and one does not see the indivisible the reason for this has been stated in the foregoing one concludes from this that there is no imperceptible time we must take into consideration the above-mentioned problem whether or not it is possible to have several simultaneous sensations by quotes, simultaneous i mean such as are experienced in the same part of the soul and in one indivisible moment of time in the first place then is it possible that the sensations be simultaneous in the sense that they are experienced in different parts of the soul and not in one indivisible part though by parts which are indivisible in the sense of forming a continuous whole or to take first what affects the single sense as e g sight shall we say that if different colours are sensed by different parts of sight it will then have several parts specifically the same for its repeated sensations belong to the same species but if one says that as in the instance of our two eyes a certain unity and single activity is produced so nothing prevents our regarding the soul in the same way if however the combination of both forms an unit then that which is perceived will be an unit and if they remain uncombined then the result will likewise be uncombined again the same sensations will be manifold in the sense in which one speaks of sciences as manifold for neither is there any actuality apart from its corresponding potentiality nor is there any sensation apart from actuality if one does not experience simultaneously the sensations which occur in a single indivisible part of the soul it is clear that one does not experience others simultaneously for it is simpler to perceive these several things simultaneously than it is to perceive generically different things simultaneously but if the soul senses sweet with one part and white with another part the derivative of these two is either an unit or it is not an unit but it must be an unit for the perceiving organ is an unit what is the unit then with which this organ is concerned for we have no unit from sweet and white there must therefore be some unitary principle in the soul whereby it perceives things as wholes as remarked above but things generically different are sensed by different organs is then the principle whereby we perceive sweet and white a single organ in so far as these qualities are united but when they are actually isolated is it a different organ that senses each of them what applies to the things themselves applies similarly to the soul 
for numerically one and the same thing is white and sweet and possesses many other qualities unless the qualities be regarded as isolated from one another and yet the essential nature of each quality is different one must likewise conclude in reference to the soul that one and the same principle numerically regarded perceives everything although its mode of expression is different in some cases generically different and in others specifically different simultaneous sensations therefore are experienced in one and the same principle of the soul but not in one and the same relation to this principle it is evident that every sensible object has a certain magnitude and that it is impossible to perceive what is indivisible there is a point from which it is impossible for one to see viz a point of infinite removal but the point from which vision is possible is determinate the same applies to the odorous and audible and to such sensations as are not tactual there is an extreme point of remoteness from which vision is no longer possible and a point of nearness at which vision begins this point must be indivisible and what is beyond it is not perceptible and what is on this side of it must be perceptible if indeed an indivisible thing is perceptible then it will follow when one places it at the extreme point from which it is no longer visible and again at the point where perception begins that it is simultaneously visible and invisible and this is impossible we have now treated in general and in particular the subject of the organs and objects of sensation in what remains we must first investigate the subject of memory and of memory's process end of chapter seven and end of on sensation and the sensible recording in memory of mitchell edwards